little bit about the, you know, these are, well, I, I gave the high level, right? And a few examples of things that have done, but there's just so much, so much out there. And I think that it's really hard to be on the cutting edge without having that um, early adopter mentality. So I'm wondering, maybe you could start by how do you feel as an early adopter in the space? You both are known as pioneers and both are known as, as early adopters. And maybe a little bit of your criteria for how do you look at new technologies and how do you look at that adoption? I'll start off and um, uh, thank you also for hosting this. Um, I uh, believe that it's, there's a, a little bit of a stigma about being an early adopter. It's okay. As a part of an early adopter, and I would say it's, it's the stigma with it, set it aside, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to waste on technology. I remember about 10 years ago, we uh, uh, were working with a tech company that's no longer around, and I think we invested about a million dollars in new development uh, hardware that is, no, is now obsolete. And as I walk through those communities, I just cringe to think, what a terrible decision but it paved the way for much better decisions, way more informed decisions. So for me, if you think about solving problems um, and using technology, you're never going to fail tackling a problem. And you just have to be very clear, what problem am I trying to solve? How am I looking to move the needle? Because the lack of doing anything is more damaging to the business. Um, and you know, you're going to make the mistakes along the way. You have to just include that in your analysis or create that room uh, in your business plan to make those failures. Um, I think that as the technology continues to evolve, what worked for us five, six years ago may no longer be relevant today. And that's okay. I think that's got to be a part of your core mindset. How about you, Brian? You're you're obviously on the uh, cutting edge, sometimes bleeding edge. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the secret to being an early adopter? Do you have criteria that helps you decide? Well, I was thinking uh, uh, a, a, a recent uh, wise sage said, "Innovation is actually like trying to teach an old dog new tricks, except in this case, the dog is your boss, and the trick is trying to get them to financially support your ideas." So, so this, is, this is part of what I struggle with a lot is I'm trying to push the organization forward um, uh, and uh, get the buy-in of uh, the, the folks uh, who write the checks and, uh, and the, you know, my team who has to deal with all of these ideas coming across uh, you know, the table here. Um, innovation is really tough. It's, um, it's timely, it's costly, and it's risky. And you just have to be, um, you know, willing to take that risk. It's, you know, it's just the culture of our company. It's, it's how we roll. It's just how we operate. And, um, you know, we're we're willing to uh, to go be out front and and take the hits, um, you know, it, it, you know, for the cause and to be on the cutting edge. You know, we we derive a lot of benefit from being there, which we can talk about as well. Um, but we make mistakes and we definitely fail and we definitely pay for that failure. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's always that risk, um, and and to your point, Stephanie, I've definitely you know worked with startups. Brian's worked with me at Aging 2.0 in his very early days, and we both are clinicians, and so we looked at things through a certain lens, and we're okay with taking these early risks. But then some folks, similar to what Stephanie said, you you're not sure if they're going to be around. They they have a great idea, but if you invest all of this time and money, is it are they going to be here? And so they go to the big guys. Well, everybody knows what happened with Care Innovations. You look at GE and Intel, and they're doing something for only so long, and then they're not getting the fast returns that they expect from their other verticals, and poof, they're gone. So it's not just a risk in early stage startups. It's a risk in the big guys who turn their head against what they're starting to do if they look at aging or they look at age tech. Um, so you know, now that I threw up the brick wall, how, how do you break down that brick wall? How do you actually vet you know, through the vendors that come to approach you, they both know, you know, they know that both of you are early adopters. What's your criteria when you look at someone? What's going to work for you? I imagine it's unique to your organization, but what, what's, what's the criteria for you when you're looking at something? I think flexibility is really important. Um, a lot of times vendors will enter our space trying to solve a problem that's not so important, but their technology is capable of doing something just a little bit more that would be far more impactful. So and we find that if a company is 
a newer entrant, they're more open or more flexible. It's an education cycle, but um, we are a learning environment at Aero, so it just sort of lends itself to the cooperation, and we like to partner up to the point that it feels like we have uh, a seat in each other's offices uh, or virtual offices, coordinating and sharing information, problem solving, looking for different ways to utilize the technology. I think that's helpful. Um, and I think the vendors find you as a result of that because your, cooperating, your, your cooperation is enabling them to reach more potential operators and solve better problems for the future. Absolutely. You're driving value in with them exactly. in their development just as much as they're helping you. Yeah, and I, I think you know, we, we get approached by a lot of vendors um, who think that they have a very uh, interesting um, solution, but it's not a problem that we're trying to solve or a problem that we need to solve right now. So it's really about, uh, for, for me, I can, I can talk to a vendor and within about two minutes I can know if this is something that I want to approach or not. Um, and in about five or ten minutes, I can make a decision. Is this something that we want to move forward and have further discussions? Um, but it really has to solve an immediate problem, whatever the solution is. And then it has to be something that we can implement very quickly and at a reasonable cost. And in many cases, when we have a lot of uh, new, new emerging companies in the space, which is really exciting. Um, but a lot, of these, a lot of these companies and these founders don't, don't fully understand the breadth of, of the, the complexity of our organizations. Um, and if they have an interesting solution, they're very smart and they're willing to be flexible and work with us um, on, on innovation, model development, and pricing, then we might be willing to sit down with them and co-develop a product together. Yes. Um, and we did that recently with a, with a company uh, that we've been working for now a couple of years on the, on the development of a, a product that's been really uh, impactful to us. And that's an example of taking a young startup and helping them to rethink how they can apply their technology to, uh, to our environments and to our population. So we look at the vetting process and the selection process, but you made a good point. Implementation needs to also be easy as well as just operate. You have to be able to operationalize it. Stephanie, how, how much do you include your team um, in that implementation and deployment process or even decision making? How, how do you, what's that success look like for you? Sure. I think it, um, one of the most exciting things we've changed in the last uh, year is we implemented the use of crowdsourcing at a whole other level. We've always done a lot of crowdsourcing for problem solving. So for those of you at, at, that um, may follow our company on like LinkedIn, we have a small thought group that for about 13 years we've taken challenges as a, as a collective and, and created a, really a space to, to deposit ideas. So we've continued to advance that over time. And this past year, we added a hackathon to our annual retreat. And actually, one of the companies here, Cubigo, was our, our sponsor for that, uh, which was super fitting. Um, and we had 14 teams of individuals across our organization submit ideas to change uh, that was, it was going to be our next big thing. And for us, you know, 15 years ago when we started doing all-day dining, that was like the next big thing. So we said it had to be equivalent to that or a technology play or a, or a solution. And it resulted in an app that is solving our staffing crisis. We couldn't find the right fit or the right flexibility with the right fit of the right vendor, so our team just built it themselves. The winning team developed this concept, and, and uh, we are in the... <laughs> in the process of, of implement, implementing that. But that idea started in January, and here we are today at the start of May, it mid-launch of this. And I think that's pretty exciting to think. Um, I stole this idea. Uh, I, I like to watch reality TV shows. And this is what Silicon Valley is doing to track top talent, not only even in colleges, but down into high school students competing in this. And I was surprised that we had three app um, entrance into this uh, this competition. So I think including, including everyone matters. It's also really exciting when different disciplines sit across the aisle. Uh, we, uh, we work with like Further, for example. Our marketing team was able to share an idea that was relevant to us on our development and consulting side of the business. And to see the share, because we're thinking not only about the technology, but the multiple uses of it, that is, I think, the biggest piece is we have more in capacity than we even know what to do. And I think the interdisciplinary approach maximizes and optimizes it. 
But if you don't include the team in the decision making, the problem solving, I think you lose on the implementation side. There's a, that becomes a, a real disconnect. And we've certainly had our share of those failures. Yeah, I, th I think uh, if you're going to do this kind of stuff, you have to have uh, like an innovation council or something, a kitchen cabinet. Put, put together your people. Um, it should include IT, you know, legal, ops, clinical uh, leaders from across those, uh, you know, different uh, departments within your organization. And then, uh, and together you, you sort of go through the innovation process. You can't, you can't just have a single person uh, in the company that does this. It's never going to work. Um, and, and, you know, you can see from Stephanie, it has to come from the top down. You have to have leadership at the very top that's interested in, in being on the cutting edge and going through the, the sometimes arduous and grueling process of figuring out how we're going to solve this problem with this piece of technology and then how you're going to execute on it. Um, so, yeah, definitely got to have the council. Yeah, I agree that interdisciplinary approach is so important. I know you'll hear from Anne later, really, like looking at lifelong learning even and, and taking academics and, and the various stakeholders and all putting them in the same room creates some pretty magical things. Um, but I, I also know there's a lot of vendors in the room who want to get into senior living or have started and they've had some failures. So I do want to approach that. How do you know while you're piloting something or trying something that you thought the group all wanted and needed, but how do you know when to um, scale fast or fail fast? You know, how, where are you making that decision to say this isn't the fit we thought it was going to be versus, okay, let's go all in? Do you have any tips on that? I think you have to start with the discipline of setting a metric from the start. Um, even if you change the metric along the way, um, it's clearing any bit of your confirmation bias. I am I get very excited about technology to a point that I'm part of the problem when it comes to when is it time to cut um, or, or continue to try to evolve the relationship and move it forward. Uh, but our analytics team holds me accountable to it with those metrics. Um, and I think that's really important. The other part is, is how fast are problems solved? Because there are going to be problems. How can you robustly communicate about those needs? How quickly is a vendor able to respond? Um, it, you know, I think between the measure and, the, and then how the relationship is working, that's going to determine your next one, two, three, how many years of deployment thereafter. Um, and you may as well sense those things early as an early indicator from the numbers to the relationship and make those decisions much faster. Yeah, and I would say uh, listen to your staff. Uh, if, 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 it, if the pilot gets through to the phase where you're executing and implementing in a building, and within you know, a couple of days your staff are pulling their hair out and they're saying, this is just not, I'm not doing this, this is not working for me, um, or they just don't adopt it right away, then that, that's a huge uh, you know, red flag right there. And, and you might want to think about pulling the plug. We, we, we had a couple of situations like that where we thought we had something that uh, might be a problem solver and might be something that really helps residents, staff, families, and and within a couple of days you just realize this is this is not going anywhere. And rather than keep trying to push it and ram it down their throats, you just pull the plug, eat the cost, <laughs> and move on. Yeah, I, I hear you. And just to add to that experience, there is also that analysis of not just making a decision in a silo and then pushing it down. Sometimes that's the reason for failure. And it's because the, all stakeholders weren't involved in the selection and deployment. So we did a pilot um, a, a, quite a while back. And it's really an end of life platform to honor people's wishes, at, at advanced directives at end of life. Well, the board decided this would be great to invest in and roll out the platform and just push it down. It makes sense. It's going to save the money that it, you know on the system. It's going to help with the hospital readmissions and all of the light, nice high-level board-level decisions. No one adopted it at the front <laughs> level. Until we started to redesign the pilot, I came in to analyze why it wasn't working. The caregiver at the bedside cares that you are helping someone in their end of life speak for them when they can't speak for themselves. They want to help honor someone's end of life wishes. They don't care what system saved money. And so sometimes it's just the approach also of co-creating the implementation and truly having a, a human-centered approach to how you're deploying, which I know you both do. Um, Stephanie, I'm very interested because you have a lot of different tech and a lot of different data points and data is always important to you. So how do you not crush the caregiver and the, the staff with so much information? How do you use the actionable insights from that data to move them forward in a way that isn't overwhelming to them? I'd love tips on that. Sure. 
Well, I'm not sure if Brian's uh, situation is similar, but we started using information um, originally for the leadership level of, the, of our home office structure, and we've continued to drive that into um, use at the property level. And so I, I think the uh, care team and how they utilize data um, is not as much of the challenge as how management uses it to create a more efficient workflow. I think if, we, if you even just start there, then we can work on the improvements at the delivery level. I think the biggest challenge we face with caregivers is that a lot of technology comes with a new device or even a new app. You know, how we're thinking about the simplicity of their use, that's just the information they need at the moment. Where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? How do I check this off? If we can keep that flowing and easy and then allow um, folks at the property level that are in charge um, of driving the outcomes, using the, utilizing the information to shift goals and outcomes or, or focus, um, I think that's, that's a good place to begin. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I'm wondering, do either of you, Brian maybe in particular, so you have a lot of affluent individuals that you serve, and so sometimes it could be perceived that, sure, technology adoption is easy when you can afford it. But what are you doing to calculate the ROI or how do you help to look at outcomes in a different way so that you can convince those people who are investing in it? And you, you said you have to you know, talk to those who are going to write the check for it. How are you convincing them that that's the right path to take? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I don't know, Stephanie, if you have the magic algorithm that helps, <laughs> helps us create um, you know, what is the ROI. If you do, let's talk afterwards. But uh, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. And maybe with ChatGPT and these other technologies, we will have that at some point very soon. But um, you know, the, thing, the, the thing with ROI is uh, you know, we, we have some tech, tech we're using now that is clearly providing value. How do I measure the value is the, is the bigger challenge. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we, we, use, um, we have a whole technology suite that, that we use for, for what I call res care. So, um, and one of that, well, not to plug one of you guys here, but, but Rendever is one of those. Um, so we do VR. We've, we've, we've done VR in our communities from the very beginning. We were early adopters. And how do you, me you, know, how do you measure the ROI of joy and happiness? Like, you know, when we, saw, we see this with our residents and with our staff when they use that product. And how do you measure that? It's really impossible to do. Um, on the other hand, um, that, that particular product, uh, because we were such early adopters, uh, we got a, a massive amount of PR and press. And, and if, if our marketing team decided to and they wanted to, they could go out and figure out, they could calculate the amount of free advertising we got from that relationship. Um, and so we, we could do something like that. But there's, there's an incredible amount of, uh, uh, of value that's created in a lot of these products that's very difficult to quantify. Well, actually, I'm going to add a comment to that. I think we are at a point where the industry may need to start defining a technology spin per unit as, as, as some standardization. I was surprised. Uh, we, we, we still do a heavy volume under my turnaround solutions umbrella of consulting business uh, for distressed assets. And I was working with a, a, a newer development that got you know, tangled up in uh, opening uh, right before COVID and slowly leasing up. Um, their tech spend was almost $125 a month without a single clinical tool in that. It was simply in uh, social engagement uh, to HR uh, technologies. It was a suite of services that I would expect to be um, a little bit more collaborative. And, and if you probably looked at uh, each of the services, many of them were replicating what the other could do. And I think if you don't have clinical solutions at the core of your tech spin, that's a, that's a missed opportunity and is very, very important because that has the greatest chance of, of uh, the return on investment. So we're on the other side of middle market to, you know, uh, as our target in our development. So we're putting this type of technology in expecting that it's going to drive outcomes that are going to impact the cost um, uh, for our residents. So it's not that, you know, we're going we're gonna to invest potentially way more than what I just quoted as, as a standard. I think we're uh, closer to 175 a unit. But what we get on the other side is um, an average of about a six-month longer stay. That, to us, is enough of a return on investment. But we're not realizing that day one, year one, year two, you know, we're several years in before we can truly see the impact. And I actually think it'll be how many more years, 
years before we're able to see the true impact of this uh, increased length of stay because as many of you could quote, COVID did shorten or create a little bit of disruption to any gains you may experience. We're seeing that flow through our data that we're now seeing a more uh, pronounced uh, longer length of stay. But that's because we're thinking of resident outcomes from day one. Yeah, I think um, you're right in, in when you're analyzing the, the landscape of what people are investing in, often they haven't looked at the whole suite that they've selected along the way. And so they don't realize they have duplicate systems. Yes. You know, you mentioned Cubigo. I've help to implement them before. And why have a POS system when in your resident engagement platform, you can have a module that has a POS system so that you're actually capturing that revenue. You can actually not have this lost revenue you know, all within the same system. Those are things we need to start looking at so that it's across a continuum and serving really the whole experience. But Brian, I know that you have lots of things that you, you see and do. What are you most excited about right now um, in, in what you're engaging with? Yeah, the, the most exciting thing is really on the clinical front. So, so we recent, well, not recently, over the past few years, we've been working with a company that uh, is in, it built, had built a system for the hospitals, which is uh, machine vision, AI, edge computing, sensor systems, et cetera, that uh, makes the, the uh, in our case, the apartment, uh, you know, one of the, uh, a part, part of the care team. Um, and what, what we're doing now is really interesting and cutting edge is, is we literally have cameras in the apartments that have AI baked into them. All the computational analysis takes place on the, on the device. And for our most vulnerable residents, memory care and, and other residents who are very high risk, we have uh, AI computer cameras in, in the apartments. And we're able to um, have visibility into the apartment for the first time in real time. We can see right on our, cam on our uh, cell phones what's going on in the apartment. Um, the, the AI in the background is monitoring all of that passively 24-7 and is letting us know if there's a potential problem or if there is a problem. Um, and then it sends us a contextual notification and says, hey, Mr. So-and-so is getting up out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. You might want to go address this. Um, and then, of course, if there is an event, it tells us that. And then we can look at our phone and say, oh, what's going on? The other thing it allows us to do is in real time do rounding on our residents throughout the 24-7. The but it, overnight, we can round on the residents. It captures all the rounding data. So it, it says we're, we're in compliance checking on our residents rather than popping the door open, looking in on them, disrupting them, throwing light into the room. Uh, we can do this all virtually. And then the other thing that it does is it, it uh, captures staff activity in the room. So it gives us, uh, it serves us up a, a clinical dashboard that gives us uh, clinical intensity or care intensity information. So it'll say, you know, in our New York City building, we have 24 floors and uh, five of those are memory care. So we can now see around the clock, anytime I want, I can look on my uh, phone and I can see the third floor is very high care intensity. And then I can drill into that and say the reason is because these two residents are taking up an immense amount of nursing time or caregiver time. Um, and and it, the, the amount of data and in information it's serving up to us 24-7 is just incredible. Um, so the, the value that that product is providing us is, is immense. And uh, for the first time, you know, it, we, we actually have um, tools at our disposal that, uh, you know, can, can help us reduce our staffing or uh, give us tools that give our staff the, the information they need to to uh, prioritize who needs to be cared for. It's really quite incredible. Yeah, the, the technology and the applications, um, you know, I, talking about partnerships, you have helped this company, you know, come from the hospital setting, a different setting, and really try to operationalize within our own setting. You know, many of you were buzzing yesterday after meeting with Nobi because they do something similar where you're really able to capture so much data and information from the beautiful lamp that sits in the room. And now we have actionable insights that we can actually, you know, um, perform better and, and produce better outcomes and really have that information at our fingertips. Um, Stephanie, I know that data is really important to you and I know you have a lot of things that you've adopted. Anything you want to feature that is really important to you, uh, things that are exciting you right now? Well, I think uh, it's building a culture of problem solving. So uh, we um, have very similar technology uh, for um, our uh, apartments and what we're using, we're uh, Particularly, I think we're, we're approaching 10 years of implementation, so we have a volume of information now that um, we are using through Power BI to start projecting 
uh, not only length of stay, but what are the disruptions of length of stay? And this information can help feed the model. And it did. It started with our team integrating everything into its own platform. So while I don't think it's critical that every problem is solved by one source or one solution, you can create that uh, common landscape. And we, we happen to use Power BI for that. We are on the point now of shifting from the stacks of data as the paginated reports, building the apps to now starting to what we call build the house. Like um, and we think of it like Legos, you color stack uh, and eventually you can create something pretty remarkable. And I think each organization has that opportunity to do it. And you know, often we'll see problems and figure out how can we do this ourselves or is this one that we need to, part we need to problem solve? Um, and during COVID our team uh, continued to invent other uses of technology that solve problems. And I think that is, um, something you'd be amazed at how much your team could have the capacity to do that. Um, and I, I never really expected that at the start. I thought it would be through vendor relationships. So if you build that culture of innovation and share and then ultimately empower uh, to uh, create those solutions, you'd be surprised at how many problems and ultimately um, you know, product lines you're developing for yourself. I think that's great. So we'll leave with one question for both of you, rapid fire. If you are a senior living operator in the room and you want to invest in something other than just the IT infrastructure and Wi-Fi in the rooms, you know, what's the first tip to get started in this investment process? What do you think, what advice would you give them? Understand the environment. Move in for a little while, experience what it's like. I know many operators have that experience, um, but how many vendors have had that opportunity? True. Yeah, and I would say uh, put, put together that council uh, and reach out to, you know, folks in the industry that are doing this all the time, and, and we can help save you a lot of time and, and headache. <laughs> Happy to do it. Yeah, that, that's really true. Uh, I think that that's come up a lot this, uh, this week, just about collaboration and the opportunity to share stories and share experiences, and certainly uh, SLIF helps us to do that in these few days and, and we're here to continue if you need anything on the age tech side. So thank you for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of the experience. Yep. Thanks guys. Thank you guys so much.